Hello, I'm Maria Jones. Thank you so much for watching One of Nine. Today we have Fee, and Fee's married to Felipe, and they've just had a little baby three weeks ago called John. And John, John Philip. John Philip, after Daddy. And after which John did you choose? Uh, John the Beloved, the evangelist. I like how he writes. I like, I like that he was a... Jesus had a soft spot for him, you know, because he was kind of... You know, that's who you'd give your mother to, the one that you're like, oh, it's just too lovely, you know. Oh. You're not called John the Beloved for nothing, that kind of thing. You can you can kind of get a sense of him from his writings, he's a bit mystical as well, you know. Yeah. The word was made flesh and all that, I like all that. Actually, I talked to Bishop John a lot about that, you know, we can... He's got, mm. he's got a really interesting stuff on that. He actually recited the, yeah, I call it the last gospel now. He mm. recited that that passage in St. John's. <laughs> in the beginning, there was the word. Yeah. yeah, that's a big thing for him. So he was my university chaplain and he, you know, was really big on like that kind of theology of the word. Okay. The word being like this kind of really carnate thing like the idea you know which is like a very jewish thing that like the the word is like this living thing like the original kind of hebrew being about the logos and the logos was like the big theory that everybody wanted to find out which actually scientifically is still what is being searched for there's not like a kind of micro and macro theory that joins all of physics together for example it's like looking for like the theory that explains the world. It will tell you how to act. It will describe all the physical components of the world. It will tell you how to act morally. You know, this is something like the Greeks were really searching for. And so that there's supposed to be a kind of jarring there. The the logos turned out to be a man. You know, that's supposed to be a bit strange. We're dead used to it, but so in fact, this is what Bishop John would say, right? The idea that this kind of solution, like how you be in the world and with the world, comes along and is Jesus, and Jesus is that like incarnate kind of intention that comes from God. You know, all the stuff later on about how, you know, the word, uh, and there's some stuff in the Psalms, but you know, the word never comes from God and goes back without being fulfilled. You know, all, all that kind of stuff, you know, Bishop John's, that was something that influenced me a lot that mm. he would talk about. What did you study, Faye? I studied, so in Glasgow Uni, that's where he was my chaplain, I studied philosophy and maths. It's like a joint degree. Then I did a master's just in philosophy. And did you move to a new uni for that one? Yeah, that was in St Andrews. Then I went to do like a PhD in philosophy, kind of met something between philosophy of mathematics and metaphysics, like that. And that I did that at Cambridge, and that's where I met Felipe. God bless our listeners. <laughs> so just backtracking a bit, Fee, you talk about going to the chaplaincy at Glasgow University, your, fir your first of three universities that you went to, which we'll come back to as well. Were you brought up Catholic? Was yes. it? Was it? So then when you went to Glasgow University, was it quite automatic for you just to think, I'm going to go and find the chaplaincy? Yeah, I checked it out and it was very strange at the time, like it was kind of grim. And while I was there, Bishop John did a lot, you know, a real wee community grew there. Because you need people to be the foundation of that kind of thing, to build it up a lot. So, you know, there was some, actually a guy I studied with, he was called Jesus, and I studied maths with him. And he was like a big figure, he was like this me the happiest Mexican I ever met. I didn't believe in him at first because I, th because I thought somebody was signing the math sign-up sheets. Jesus, oh, Jesus, and I'm thinking, now that was really funny, like the first time somebody that I was like, good one, and I'm like, they keep doing it, that's getting old, that joke, Jesus keeps signing up for the, the maths tutorials, but it was him, it was Jesus, when I eventually met him, he's like, Jesus, I'm like, oh, this, this sorts something out for me, <laughs> it's not a joke. It's not a common name in the UK at all. Because you're right at Jesus, but you do you know, you don't think of it. So, the, so yeah, he was like a big... So there's kind of people that came to the Glasgow chaplaincy really built up. So by the time I kind of left there, it was quite kind of blossoming. The main thing is there's lots of people, lots of families, lots of young people, like... And I think it's really important because you basically go in and you have a look at the chaplaincy if you're a Catholic and you go, like, am I going to get real friends here or not? Like, that's what you think. You, yeah. you suss that out very quickly because you're going to all the fresher stuff and you're going to... You're like, where am I going to commit? Where am I going to get my friend's family? Like, I, I'm not going to be here out of charity. You know, I need the support network and mm. stuff. So, like, the fact that people can find that at the chaplaincy is really important. I think it's really formative. 
So when you went in, it was a bit grim, but something still held you in there? No, I didn't I didn't invest at the start. Okay. I just like I kept my eye on it though. I would go back and like people let Joe Black and you know, you're talking to him would let be hovering around as well and you know, it gets to a critical mass, a community, where you're like, right, okay, now we can join in, now we can like actually live together, like and enjoy ourselves. So mm. it, it got to that probably when I was in like my third year and then I would spend more time there. So in terms of keeping the faith, how did you do that for the first two years? Because it is tricky, like you say, without community. I just had my parish community, like my parish priest. I would, because I lived at home, mm. and that's another pure oh, Scottish yeah. thing. Like we've got the most home staying students. Like, because in England, I think it's a bit of a thing, fly in the nest. But in Scotland, we're like that. Why would you fly the nest? Do you hate the nest? I've built this nest for you. Like, you know, is it? We're a bit parochial like that, you know, so... And you've still got the accountability of your family, it's then you're in the family home, you've got yeah. some rules probably to follow. Yeah, and probably the last year of high school, I started taking responsibility for my own faith. I went in mass every day for the first time during Lent. I remember that. Are you awake? And was that a personal call that you felt, or was that like the community helped to draw you in? No, it was just, I guess, kind of decided on my own just about my beliefs and how I wanted to act in accordance with them. Mm. You know, as a, as a kind of early teenager, I just wasn't interested. I found it all really boring, to be honest. Because, um, you know, you're given it, you know, so you take it for granted. And then I just kind of came to the position, quite probably obscure philosophical position, that, like, you know, you need to be in one kind of worldview if you want to get to reality. You know, this, this is sometimes called a kind of a pluralist approach, right? So there's no, like, objective truth apart from if you're in, like, a, a, a particular worldview. But anyway, the point being that you need to kind of embody one of those and live if you want to access reality in some way. Any kind of, like, inner dimension, inner life, mm -hmm. spiritual life. So I kind of came to that. Then I was, like, a Buddhist for a week. Because obviously that's when you're a teenager, that's like the cool religion. Yeah, that's you're like, I'll be a Buddhist then, right? And then, then I realised I didn't know anything about Buddhism, right? And I was learning a bit more. I'm like, I don't know. So then I was like, what am I doing? Like, I've already know everything about Catholicism. My whole family are doing it. Especially my, my grands were a big influence. Then I just was decided to go with the Catholicism. But that was quite a very pragmatic choice. And then there was many years of burning through various layers of apathy. You know, like, you know, bits of it that you found boring, rediscovering it, you know, mm. in a voice that wasn't there. And then anymore. Sorry, one second. Rupert, do you, okay. wanna, do you wanna, I did say they could watch a little film on my phone. I just don't know where my phone's gone. Oh, freedom! What will you do without freedom? We will run! And we will live! But you deceived me. You let yourself be deceived. Well, when we moved and Jesus was all wrapped in tissue paper there, when he came out, I put him up there. He had his just wee eyes looking at you as if he was desert version Jesus, you know. And so you'd be sitting here in this wee living area and you'd just see him looking at you being like that, ah, mysterious Jesus. He's quite high-minded thoughts for a teenager. Yeah, I was thinking this too. You can't really switch the computer off, you know, like it's a wee bit, which is a bit blessing and a curse, you know. I liked the stuff with the like, lotus position. Hilarious. I was dead into that. I was like, oh, so yoga wasn't funny. really a thing. I was like, because I was so bendy, me and my friend used to used to do like <laughs> so contortionist stuff, but more interested in that. So I was like, we used Are to you do. Drink? No, I'm alright. So That's funny. very, it's very thoughtful. <laughs> just suddenly thought, just suddenly thought I got my tea over, which is so yummy. Thing in our house, it's <laughs> it's actually a sin. We classify yeah. it as a sin. Yeah, go on. It's called selfish tea. Oh, go, if you've got tea and no one else has. Just go and make yourself tea. You just come back, sit down with tea, and everyone's yeah. like that. Excuse uh, me. Like Lego. Lego. Yeah, that. See, me. it's so funny you say that. I was about to say that to you because, see, me and my sister, we were a year apart. We shared an imaginative world. Like, there was, like, a rule, there's, like, rule and shape to it that you had this, like, objective, like, you know, there was a way you would play everything and yeah. other kids would come in and get it wrong. Right, right. <laughs> like, Upset system. Yeah, so we were so deep in that, but the Lego was the, the big thing the for us. It. Yeah, that was we that was the toy that that we we always had, you know. We scraped together over the years, I think, right? And they have one kid and we're like, I could never have more kids. But it's like then they invert. 
You know, then you're not. It's because the grown ups are playing with the kids mm. as if the grown ups are kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but see, when they've got the, each other for company, you go, there, there you go. Yeah, that's right. And they just like form each other like that. It was like yeah. that. But you're right, yeah. Once you've got two, three isn't. Three actually, in some ways, makes it easier because of the age and stage. Yeah, it just depends. And you don't can't you can't account for all the things that will happen in pregnancy and stuff. So it might be a bit harder, but it might get easier. But by the time you get four and five, shucks. You might as well just keep going. Yeah. Or oh, God willing, a lot of this you say God willing, your health and all these kind of things. You can't legislate for, can you? But. It's just like what what I like about the videos is you know sitting watching two people chat. You can watch that for a wee while, but what what I really love is because we're all dead nosy about people, yeah, yeah, yeah. and I love like that you just show these shots of wee things happening, mm. wee bit of the house, because it's when you go into a house that's what you get. Yeah, You're like that. Yeah. Oh look, they've got that wee picture. Obviously, the the crown has to go to when you filmed your brother, because it's like intercut woman chat, intercut with man destroys tree, giant tree. We said that. We said that. I said I've met people on the level before that. That are like you know they're manly and that they're doing this or they're doing that yeah. or they're quite extreme or they like hands-on stuff yeah. or whatever and then this is like a level I didn't know about. See that bit of the video where she says somebody described Declan as primitive man. The closest thing to early man. Closest thing early man and then you just flash this picture of him with a lip and spear gun ah. standing in a boat with a child <laughs> and then I'm like that's the only time I've watched the videos and laughed. We were saying, we like Wes Anderson. Do you like Wes Anderson as a Do film guy? Like yeah. the... He's like a Wes Anderson archetype. Mm, yeah, like you yeah, would just yeah, show yeah. him standing yeah. with the spear in the boat. <laughs> So when you went to the next university, maybe you couldn't stay at home because that's quite a trek. No, I stayed in St Andrews, but I did go home every weekend to do my job, which partially funded my masters. That was a bit mental. But anyway, um, there was a much better chaplaincy there, um, and they, St Andrews is quite a small uni, mm. so they had this wee building that you just go and hang out. Uh, so I got friendly, and of course, like half of them are American in St Andrews. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's unreal. It's like another state. Why? Why do the Americans want to go there? They love it because of the romance of the royalty being there. And they, I think they did a big advertising push in America for the, all the overseas students. So, I mean, you're just there and people would be like, oh, oh, you're Scottish? I'm Scottish. <laughs> I, I haven't met a Scottish woman yet, like stuff like that. And you'd just be like, oh, I didn't hear it. And the just, uh, where are you from? I, we're from the upper part. And I actually overheard two Americans walking. They were like walking down the street and obviously one was a visitor, one studied there and she says to the other one, like, it's just like Hogwarts. And how far are we from Scotland right now? That's what she said, like in St Andrews. And I said to her, I was thinking to myself, quite far actually, quite far somehow. So like, it's, it's just unreal. You know, that was a kind of its own thing. That was a very kind of intensive masters. I was there for two years. But the intensive bit was like the first year that was like the top masters and it was like the most work I've ever done in my life. Like they've actually subsequently changed it because it was too much, like people were having breakdowns. So Did you have Catholics on your course? There was Catholics on my course, but they were the Americans and they were private about it, you know? Like that was quite interesting. That was the first time I met like conservative Americans, Catholics. Conservative Catholics, because like from my culture, the Catholics were always poor. They were like the Irish immigrants, the Polish and the Italian that had settled in Glasgow. So Catholics were always a bit lefty leaning, right? And then there was these Catholics and they'd be at mass. And I remember being in the church, there was these guys and they would wear tails to mass and they would sit up the front row and during the Our Father, they would all stand up and recite it loudly in Latin when everyone else is saying it in English, you know? And they were kind of like, some of them were English and some of them were American. 
and I would gawk at them and my American friend Craig would be like, V, you can't stare at them. Stop it. Like, you know, he'd be like, and I'd just be like, wow, look at that. Look at them. I've never seen people. Like that. Were you so, quite encouraged to see that? Yeah, like, I, I just like people doing all sorts of things, you know, it was just like totally eye opening. As a hat, what would you do? What does what is the chaplain say? What would you do? Would you just poke these posh people with a pot? I would poke mm. them. Uh, <laughs> just, yeah, they probably I was probably quite annoying to be honest because I just found them so exotic. But like, but anyway, you know, you there would be talks every week. Couldn't have daily mass because the priest would actually go around like Anstruther and stuff like that. He couldn't say mass just in St Andrews. He was kind of spread. Uh, but we would have like mass. Um, like, kind of in the chaplaincy house. Mm. Like the main thing is they had a house, so you would go there and you would study, hang out, make a cup of tea. Oh, so you could hang out there. And would that be a common thing now? Now you've been to three universities. Is this the that sort is, of thing you found? It is. It's yeah. very, very important. You've got that common space. And what happens is each generation comes in and colonises it and makes it their own. And the creation of that space and the relationships in that space, that makes that kind of family dynamic mm. you know there's a place to go and there's new and people every year there's people, people that leave every year, year so that has to keep kind of reinventing itself but it's like that's where you get the real grounding of like some kind of identity that they can carry with mm. them and they can form themselves i remember i think it was this really my pal said to me that this really good priest had, had said to him once it always stuck with him that like you're formed by your peers like that's the the, the key formation is like by your fear, peers. You have the lots of influences from like your parents and like you know priests and different scriptures and stuff. But like the actual kind of formation of who are you going forward in this generation predominantly happens through like these peers where you're saying like he's the same as me and he's doing it. Mm. And what am I doing? Yeah, I Why find am I not really influential in my life for sure. And that's what I'm really passionate about my children having Catholic friends. And it's interesting talking about the chaplaincy because I went to university, but I I lived at home like you. I'm from Irish family, and so for my mum as well, she was like, well, here's home. There's the university. But sort of put two and two together. So I lived at home, went to uni, and I so I didn't sort of feel the, particularly the need to find a Catholic chaplaincy. Nor had I actually heard about what a Catholic chaplaincy is. Oh. Rupert, can you get Audrey, please? Do you want to play with some blocks of wood? That's oh. about as fun as it gets in Oh, here. that's fun. So, Fee, you, you mentioned somebody earlier that you, you'd seen around at the chaplaincy, and now he's married to another Catholic, and they're living out their faith. And do you think this is maybe, like, part of the foundations of where people are going to next? And like our pet, we could have ho holy, holy parents, and they give us all the ingredients we need, but really, certainly for me, and maybe you've experienced it as well, it was the peers, the people that I was surrounded by that were influencing me the most. And so when I was more sort of in the secular circles, people that weren't particularly practicing a Catholic lifestyle, then that's what I was doing, you know, because that's what was real. It's true, and it's such a human thing because you can't rely on the generation above you. You need to find out, what's my generation doing? Because at the end of the day, that's who you're stuck with. Won't have your parents forever. You look at your parents and think, that was all right for you guys to do, you know? Like, my parents had, like, one... The baby boom era had about, like, one million friends that were just automatically, like, in the local parish prayer group. You know, that was easy for them to find husbands and so on. But, you know, I had to go to Brazil. No, I'm kidding on. Um, but, you know... <laughs> yeah, but it's like, you know, the peer group... Uh, are always going to be the ones that at some point, unfortunately, the kids have to turn outwards and, and make their peace with, you know, so... So the chaplaincies are really an essential part because was there priests that were influential to you in your yeah, chaplaincy time? I would say, like, having seen quite a few chaplaincies now, I've been to visit French chaplaincies, blah, 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 like, you know, one of the, the ingredients that, you know, it's very... You can see it's either working or it's not. It's either providing a kind of foundational community or it's not. And one of those ingredients is the, the priest, the influence of the priest. Is he opening the, the, the door up, right? Is he like challenging himself to be available for everyone? Being just themselves amongst the young people is, is like just an amazing thing. It's something that Bishop John's incredible at. And you felt like you had a personal relationship with Bishop John. He, he, he gave you time. Everyone, he gave everyone. I mean, he knew your, all your names. He, he picked you out, he checked, he was full of that kind of energy. and Did you enjoy and then, being around him? Absolutely, yeah, he's a very inspiring man. And, and then in the 
And then in Cambridge, there was the Father Mark Langham, who's, who's very sadly died this year. That was a great blow to us all because he was the one who really reinvigorated the chaplaincy in Cambridge and he just opened it up and he knew how to let people take control of a, their own little bit, you know. So he would, he would encourage people from lots of different, who wanted to run lots of different groups and things and he knew how to Within come in, encourage, but not take over. And I think that was amazing. You also yeah. Did yeah. Oh, I, I, to I, I work, I was like very involved in Chaplaincy when I arrived. Are you still in contact with him? Yeah, yeah, just um, they're, they're in London now. What a couple again. And, and as you said earlier, you know, you see when the chaplaincies work, it, what happens is, you know, you get a kind of familial structure that exists out with the family. Mm -hmm. So very much like Father Mark, for example, he was like everybody's a wee bit the dad, you know, as we, that's why we call him father, really. So that's him truly doing his job. You get different, you know, maybe I was a bit older, I was a graduate student. So I was kind of fulfilling the role of maybe like slightly older cousin, you know, that cousin that comes in, or like, I at least like to be cool auntie, right? I didn't like to get to mumsy. There's all the kind of really young, fresh faces, people that have been there for a wee while, and just you get all those, pater like people, people are relating to each other and helping each other, you think, you would never have socialised together. Never, but because they were in that space, you know, uh, the socially strong lifted, lifted up the socially weak, and and like saw that as like no, because this is who we are, you know, we're we're together in this. The the body of the church, you know, you you had that kind of tangible, and the amount of people that were just coming in, staying like they were coming in for the friends, staying staying and got converted, staying for the mass. You know, it was like that. The amount of people. So people come in that's not Catholic. Yeah, they were coming in not Catholic, Catholic curious. Um, there was this one guy, right, who I won't name, but like he had been on the edge of being Catholic for years. Nobody could push him over the edge. He's in such a house for about five minutes, you know, and then he's like, um, right, I'm happy to do it now, you know, because, cause like, you know, I think, especially in a country that's not predominant, predominantly like practicing Catholic. You do feel you're going it alone, you know, and you forget, like, if you're doing it and that, you know, how fun must it have been in the early church, apart from all the persecution, you know. Sorry. And you shut the door now. So you know, you know we're like when you put your mouth in your mouth. When, when our young people go to university, this is like a time in their life where it can go, their life can very much go one way or the other. And so I think it's, it's worth like having, having a real serious think about at that point of university, what is going to help us? What's going to keep our faith? The chaplaincy. And even if it is a bit grimy and tricky, would you even may, maybe now in hindsight look back and think, I could just go in there and stick at it? I think what it taught me is the chaplaincies have to be thriving. Yeah. They have to be thriving and, and we all take a bit of responsibility for that. Mm. And uh, at the time, it was the right thing for me not to invest in the chaplaincy because there was nothing there. And actually, like, I did a wee bit of this, a wee bit of that, a wee bit of acting, a wee bit of like with these other wee mad pals. And that made me grow up a lot and made me like socially confident in a way that I hadn't been. So when I got to Cambridge, I could kind of be a bit more like, right, if I'm going to invest here and, 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 and build up this space a bit deliberately.
So, Fee, where did you then meet Felipe? I met him in chaplaincy. <laughs> There's many, there's many facets to this story, but um, which chaplaincy? The, the Cambridge one. Cambridge. Yeah, he came. He wasn't speaking much English, and the English he did spoke, he didn't hear any of it coming out my mouth. You know, uh, so I was very hard for him to understand. So I used to speak to him, and he'd just get this kind of really bewildered look in his eyes, and kind of I was a bit like, um, oh, this guy, you know. But he's really good at hiding that he didn't understand because he'd had to do that. He'd had to pretend to be French before that. He was studying in France. It was just like, it was just like, I thought he was pure like, oh, he's just a maths guy. But actually, he couldn't really understand what I was saying. I'd be like, you all right, Felipe, how you doing? How's your PhD? He'd be like, yes. <laughs> you know, like. So we had, we had about a year of that. Um, and then, you know, gradually, um, well, it wasn't that gradual actually, was it? I just took an interest. That's what happened. I mean, I, I, had, I had gone through a series of um, very misplaced crushes, right? And I was, I was kind of having a time where I wasn't having a boyfriend. In the Catholic chaplaincy. I shouldn't disclose that really, should I? I mean, it's not that big. In and a, let's say in and around. Let's say in and around, right? <laughs> He's stirring for the gossip. And then, basically, I had then had this moment where I was like that. Oh, I get it. Whenever I have a crush on somebody that's always a terrible person for me to go out with. That seems to be the pattern, right? And then I remember I was very much at this stage, I actually said to God, like, right, I'll do it your way. I've done it my way for ages. I'll do it your way. Like, I'll just try it this once. And so I was really, like, had my eyes open, looking at people, and I thought, right, well, let's start with the holy boys. You know, the holy boys, all the wee altar servers, they were all lined up there. Here we go, right? So I was kind of checking them out, ticking them off. <laughs> um, you know, wasn't clear that it was like I was kind of sussing them out. It was always made a bit ambiguous, like, we're just hanging out with him to be here as well. That's what I mean. And then um, got to Felipe, and then he was, he was an altar server. Felipe, he was a very high level pious or whatever you know i was kind of sussing felipe out but felipe's too clever he knew i was sussing him out so he would show up at the chapel and some more and stuff like that and you know it wasn't fireworks at all it was the only time i've gone in with my eyes open and you know felipe's not the kind of guy i would usually have noticed at that point in my life you know i would have overlooked him and i had overlooked him for like a year do you know what i mean and i just got a few wee things where i'm like you know that's like he's just finding me cute it's not any effort, it's not competitive. It's, it's just so natural, it's just so like... And I just I just thought I would just pursue this a bit, but I wasn't having a big crush on him. So you why know? was this different from what you were doing before? Why was this the God's way? I would just have a huge crush on somebody and I'd, I, I would only ever go out with them to appease the release of my own deviant emotions, do you know what I mean? And then I'd get bored of them and then that would be it. You know, like that, once the explosion's over, then I'd just be like... I wasn't finding a version of me that I was competing with and then finding me better in the end. I found somebody who was totally not me, totally opposite me and Felipe. We barely have anything in common, apart from our relationship at that point, right? And uh, Catholicism. And then I, like, started from the basis that we both looked up to each other. And that was, like, the foundation of it all, really. We both kind of admired each other. You know, that internal strength, that kind of capacity for self-giving that we both saw in each other. You can see, you don't need to know someone that well, you can see that they would have that kind of internal strength, you know? Because you want a certain quality of love, right? You want a quality of love. And, you know, I think we'd both given up on finding that a wee bit. I mean, Felipe was like, I can't imagine being married, I'm going to be a priest. And I was like, I can't find a man that I feel is strong enough you know, like, um, um, so that I guess that's God telling me to be a nun after this. Do you know what I mean? So we were both in that kind of zone. And I think as well, when we give that little opening to God, whether we can put words to it or not, I think just opening our hearts and saying, God, I'm going to do it your way, whatever it is, yeah. he will work through that. Yeah, and, and we don't we, have to know all the answers and everything else. And, and then this is the result. Yeah, Ma Mary was like a huge part in our getting us together and keeping mm. us together. Can't always explain these mm -hmm. things. Did you start praying to her? Said the rosary together at the start, but, you know, you're a very aspirational Catholic yeah. couple. This was like, you know, and I hadn't been in like a Catholic, <laughs> I hadn't had a Catholic boyfriend before, so I was like chuffing myself. And then also, you know, Felipe 
uh, that was something we talked about early on. Just like Mary and and Philippe was reading a, that kind of de Montfort book at the time. Just later on, when there were some really difficult things, I remember just before we were getting engaged, I think you hadn't come to my grandmother's funeral or something. And I was like, could I, can I forgive that? And it was like a big thing for me. I really felt the grace, like you just feel it. You don't really see it. And, and you know, we had a lot of fights in the beginning. You know, we've had a kind of back to front relationship. We had all our fights up front and now it's just pure plain sailing, you know. <laughs> Hello. Once, once we could actually communicate with each other, it's always been fine. You know, we never, re we escalate, but we never fight, you know. We started dating, dated for about three years, got engaged. Two of those in the chaplaincy. Two of those in the chaplaincy. I wanted to get engaged way sooner. I, I had given Felipe an ultimatum. Felipe thought his life would be over once he got married. He's like, it's terrible. Love's been married, don't you? Don't you? Yeah. Don't you? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it, it's like, I can't believe I nearly never get married. Because, you know, it's one thing going out in that environment and then then he, he was in London, I was in Glasgow. Either we're going towards marriage with us or or not. Or, mm. I'll, or I'll find somebody else to get married to, you know, because I want to get married. Mm. You know, you get a bit like that. So I came to visit him in London and we had been having all these wee fights and then I just saw in his face came in, he told me he loved me, because, you know, that hadn't been something we said that much. And then it was just, it's been plain sailing ever since, you know, really. He got married in Scotland probably. I got married here, just with all my family, my mad family and all that. And then you lived in London for a while. And then I went to London with him, and then, I'm, and then I was like, I can't have kids in London without, like, my mum, my family, mm. you know, the, the, the village. I can't attempt to do it, you know. So here we are with, we, oh my gosh, with young John gorgeous. here. Young John. He is a gorgeous baby. 2017, left chaplaincy. One year engaged, uh, married in 2019. So from 15 to 19, that's uh, four years. Fee, thank you so much for having us today. It's been such a treat to come meet a Scottish lady in Scotland and and get your story and share it with everyone. So thank you. Keep Fee and her family in your prayers, please. Thank you for watching and thank you for, for supporting our work. We've been able to come to Scotland this week and meet some of the gorgeous families here. Please, if you're not supporting and you're enjoying our channel, consider supporting us. Thank you so much and God bless.